In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Hi, welcome to the In the Last Days television program with myself, Martin Blackham. Natalie's behind the scenes today, but she says hello to you. Uh, if you were watching last week, we were talking about uh, the last days, a Jewish perspective on the end of times with Rabbi Pesach Walicki. And we again this week, we're very excited to say that we've got him again in the studio. Thank you so much for coming Thank across, you. and Thank we so appreciate, much, appreciate that. Uh, Rabbi Pesach Walicki, uh, works for the organization, the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation in Efrat. And uh, if you remember, we also had David uh, Nekrutman on from the organization. Rabbi Pesach Walicki was uh, originally, you were, you were born in the United States, but you were raised in Canada. Yep. Um, he made Aliyah to Israel in 1994, came uh, to the land of Israel to live here. He's an associate director at the lecturer at the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation in Frat. He, this is a, amazing. You were serving as a head of a yeshiva, which you actually, I think you even maybe started that. I'm not I did. sure about I did, the history yes. of it, but uh, you were uh, the, the, the Rosh, as they say here, the head of the, yeah. uh, the yeshiva. Uh, in uh, Bet Shemesh. Uh, you've also been a rabbi in uh, Virginia, a development director of Hill, Hill, Hillel Academy in Fairfield, director of the Fairfield Jewish Experience, and you've worked as a political activist. Um, you've written for, you've written articles for the Breaking Israel News, the Times of Israel, Israel National News, Charisma News. Some of you may know uh, the Charisma News. Um, I think it's even a magazine in the United States. Um, and the Connecticut Post in the United States, um, and you live in Beth Shemesh, uh, and you're married to Kate, and um, thank you so much for coming thank and you. joining us today and talking about a Jewish perspective, which is so exciting to, to have it from, uh, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers, you will be just glued to this to, to learn how is it that Jewish people look at the end times. We have very fixed in the Christian evangelical world views of how the end times play out, but lo looking at it from a uh, Jewish perspective. Um, thank you, Martin. Um, last time, you know, we talked about historical perspective and, and looking at what's going on in Israel and, and seeing the prophecy fulfilled around us. I, I want to get into some more specifics about, about where we are in, in history and where we are in the process of redemption of the end of days. Uh, the messianic which age, a, whatever you want to call it. Which is another way, uh, which is another terminology that we don't perhaps have is the redemption, which is something very kind of Jewish, but from right. the, uh, some of the, some of uh, the elder, elderly Christian people may remember they had redemption in their theology, <laughs> but uh, for the younger people, redemption is quite a new, oh. uh, a new kind of concept. But um, that's something that's very key, isn't it, to the end, end of days? It is. I mean, for, you know, for Jews, the, the word redemption has a number of connotations. Uh, it, is, it is how we refer to the end. Um, we refer, uh, the Hebrew word geula means redemption, which is the Hebrew word for the whole process. Uh, when we talk about uh, in our prayers for the state of Israel, we, we refer to the state of Israel as the first flowering of the redemption uh, of our people. Um, but redemption also is about the world. It's about redeeming the world. Um, and, uh, and elevating the entire world. For us, the, the story is not over when the people of Israel are in the land of Israel or even when the temple is built. The story is only over when, when knowledge of God covers the earth like the waters cover the sea, when, when on that day uh, God will be king over all the earth and, his, and, and he will be one and his name will be one. That is, that is the end goal. Uh, but like I said, I'd like to get into some of the specifics, some, some interesting parts of Jewish tradition that relate to the end of days and, and where we are. Uh, there's, a, there's a verse in Psalms that says that uh, a thousand years in your eyes, meaning God, a thousand years in God's eyes uh, is like a day. Uh, you know, a thousand of our years is like a day for God. Now, 
God lives above time. God is, uh, you know, lives in a timeless realm. Uh, and so it's easy to view a verse like that as some kind of, uh, you know, homiletic or, 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 or you know, or, or poetry. But this is, this is scripture. This is, uh, you know, th these, are, these are divine words. Uh, and this verse is the basis for a teaching that is found in the Talmud that, uh, that's, that states that the world, meaning history, because um, the word olam, which means world, in Hebrew means the world, but it also means time, all of time. Uh, so the word forever in Hebrew is le'olam. But if I say, the, the, if I'm referring to the world, I also say olam, which is an interesting Interesting. And there's uh, the expression um, that you say in in in, uh, in Jewish thought, the one of fixing the world. Uh, tikkun olam. Tikkun olam. Right. So it's yeah. fixing the world, but but again, the world also implies time, or or God is referred to in one of our, one of the prayers that we say at the end of our at the end of our prayer service uh, as Adon Olam, that God is the the Lord or the Master of the world. But if you think about the connotation of the word Olam, meaning time. It also means that he's the master of time. He, God controls, you know, God's, the, you know, it, it's his story. Um, so to, to go back to that verse, a thousand years in your eyes is like a day. Uh, so based on that, in the Talmud, uh, it says that, that there are 6,000 years. That the world, time, history is 6,000 years. And the obvious allusion to the six days of creation uh, that... Was, is this something that the rabbis is, is considered as um, something the rabbis generally thought about, or? Yeah, it, it's it's a line in the Talmud. I mean, uh, there's there's a. I mean, the Talmud is 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 uh, is encyclopedic, and most of it is 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 legal discussions. But there's also discussions of of, of theology and of in this case eschatology, uh, and you know, uh, there's all of Jewish wisdom, uh, you know. Is, has its source somewhere in the Talmud. There's, uh, you know, there's, it, includes, it includes stories and, um, uh, and advice for living and, 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 and statements about history. So this statement uh, says that the world is 6,000 years, that uh, history is 6,000 years, and at the end uh, is, is, uh, is the coming of the Messiah, the redemptive age. And uh, so the, the allusion to the, to the six days of creation is rather obvious. And since that, since the Talmud, in the in the uh, millennia that have passed since the since that statement was originally uh, written, there has been much written about this statement about what exactly it means and and uh, you know, different interpretations or theories as to as to what it could be referring to. And uh, what's fascinating is that as time goes on and we move further along in the story, you know, a a as you get further along in in any book that you're reading, you could be re you know reading a nice long novel. Things that weren't clear at the beginning become clear as you go, and the same thing is happening. Uh, the same thing is happening with this story. And so, from a from a Jewish perspective, you know, our calendar, according to our our counting, uh, our tradition has it that we're now in the year five thousand seven hundred and seventy-six, which means that we are seven hundred and seventy-six years into the sixth day the sixth day. Now, if anyone's ever been to uh, a Jewish community, or especially Jerusalem, on a Friday afternoon, you see that everyone's really getting ready for the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, it, uh, you know, it, so the same is true historically. Where we are right now is Friday afternoon, and, and we're getting ready for the Sabbath. But I want to get into even more detail. Um, if you take the, the 6,000 years, and that's 6,000 years from the birth of Adam, and you can, go, you can open up a Bible and see how long he lived and how old he was when he had his children and, and, and those, those lists of, of names and numbers and the dating of events in the Bible is right there if you pay enough attention to those, to those verses that are sometimes kind of boring uh, and, and you count up the years, you'll get to us living in, in, uh, in, the, in the year 5,776. So if we go back 776 years from now, we would find ourselves in the year 1240. The year 1240 would be on the Jewish calendar, the year 5000, which is the beginning of the sixth 
godly day. And in Jewish tradition and in Jewish law, Friday, the sixth day, is the day of preparation for the Sabbath. So if we think about that historically, the sixth millennium, the sixth divine day, the sixth godly day, is the day of preparation. And if we go back to that point, to, to the 13th century, we would not exactly see the beginnings of the redemption. It was probably the low point in the history of the Jewish people in their entire exile. The population of Jerusalem, the Jewish population of Jerusalem was at its lowest point in the middle of the 13th century. This is documented. And from that point, it starts to grow, slowly at first, but certainly someone living through it would not see the beginnings of a redemption. And the same is true in the natural world. According to the verses of the Bible in the creation story, evening comes before morning. The day starts with the night. And, you know, in Which the is the Jewish concept, and uh, for our viewers, it'd be quite interesting because we have this concept of the day starting uh, in the morning and finishing in the evening, but right. for the Jewish people, and, and hence the reason you, on a Friday you're very excited because Shabbat's starting, and even evening. though for us right. we think, well, it starts Saturday, but actually it starts At Friday, sundown on Friday. Friday night. Exactly. So, and, and all of our holidays are like that. Our holidays always begin with sunset what you would call the night before, mm -hmm. meaning Friday, Friday evening when the sun sets is the beginning of the seventh day, because evening, as it says right there in the creation story, just open up Genesis 1, evening, morning, day one, evening, morning, day two. So the, the nighttime comes first. Well, spiritually speaking, nighttime is a time of darkness. It's a time of concealment. It's also a time of quiet preparation. What do we do at night? come home, we rest up, maybe we you know, take a shower, we, we relax, we sleep, all in preparation to be productive the next day once the sun rises and it's time to come out again. So the evening is, is a time where, ex, you know, on the outside, progress isn't being made, but there's a quiet preparation going on. So the same is true here. For 500 years, for the first half of day six, for the first half of that sixth millennium, from the year 1240 on the Christian calendar to the year 1740, approximately, to the mid-18th century, there wasn't what you would call a whole lot of progress. The Jewish population grew somewhat in the land of Israel, but in the, in the latter half of the 18th century, is when large numbers of Jews, especially from Europe at first, started moving back to the land. And it was because of this awareness. There were great rabbis in Europe who told their students, it's sunrise, it's Friday, the Sabbath is coming, it's time to go home. And people started to come back. But if we get even more specific, Let's get even more specific. I mentioned before the 43 years and, and four months. Well, there, the, in the creation story, right at the, uh, at the end of Genesis 1, the beginning of Genesis 2, where it introduces the seventh, the end of the sixth day and the beginning of the Shabbat, the last line of Genesis 1 is, and it was evening and it was morning, the sixth day which is how each of the six days of creation ends. But there's a nuance in the Hebrew that is not detectable in the English translations, which is that there's an extra letter in that verse that doesn't appear in all the other verses at the end of the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and fifth day, where in all of those days it says, it was evening and it was morning, second day. It was evening and it was morning, third day. It was evening and it was morning, fourth day. And then when it gets to the sixth day, it says it was evening and it was morning, the sixth day. It has the word the, which in Hebrew is just a single letter, the letter he. And it seems to be, to serve no point. Sixth day, the sixth day. Why is there this extra letter there? So in the tradition of Jewish mysticism, there's a teaching that goes all the way back. This is a millennia old teaching that says that that extra letter He, the letter He is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, 
And therefore, it also has the numerical value of 5. And this teaching, which was, again, it was written about centuries and centuries ago, taught that, that from the fifth hour of the sixth day, ha shi shi, the fifth of the sixth, from the fifth hour of the sixth day, the transition into the Sabbath has already begun. Because if you think about the natural world, think about God's world, transitions don't happen in the natural world suddenly. People don't conceive a child and the next day it's born. Things happen gradually. Things happen in, in transitions. There are intermediary phases. So, so too with the Shabbat, with the Sabbath coming in or the, or the, the redemption, the end of days coming in. It's a process. So this teaching is that that process begins in earnest at the fifth hour of the sixth day. Now, if we count it up, from the year 1740, 1740, which is 500 years into the sixth millennium, that is the point that we'll call sunrise. If we count forward five hours, five periods of 43 years and four months, we arrive at the springtime of 1948. Wow. The springtime of 1948, right in between the UN vote granting Israel a state and the actual declaration of the state. Somewhere right in between those is where the precise date would fall out. And that's the perfect time for it because a declaration of the state of Israel without the UN voting would never have worked. But the UN granting the people of Israel, the Jewish people, a state, but the Jewish people not declaring a state and accepting that offer, the offer could have been rescinded. So the, the, just like any historical event, like let's say I asked you, what's the date of World War II? You couldn't name a date. You could pick the beginning, you could pick the end, you could pick the middle. Historical events, unless they're actually one-day events, are processes. So if we're, to, if we're to put our finger on the historical event of the founding of the state of Israel, it too is a process. So that process, right there in the middle of that, imagine a, a calculation based on a biblical verse which incorporates 6,000 years of history and an ancient teaching on a verse in Psalms and an ancient teaching on a verse in Genesis all come together so precisely the springtime of 1948. Wow. Sovereignty over the land of Israel returns to the ingathered exiles of the people of Israel to their land as foretold in Deuteronomy 29 and 30. And Deuteronomy 29 and 30 immediately follow Deuteronomy 28, which speaks of the terrible horrors of suffering. And the declaration of the state of Israel comes right after the Holocaust. The sequence of events, the timing of the events, is so, is so perfect, but what else could it be? And miraculous that, that, that they happened in that sequence. Yeah. Um, you know, that Ben-Gurion made that declaration at that time and that the UN made their declaration at that time, yeah, you know, which we take for granted a bit, really, that because Ben-Gurion was forced into a position where he had to do something and because the UN had to sort out the issue. And yeah, you know, I, I sometimes think that our being, uh, uh, you know, excited by that is almost insulting to God. I sometimes wonder that, you know, when I eventually go up to meet my maker, that God will say to me, why were you, why were you acting so surprised? Did you, you know, it should be obvious. Of course, that's how it plays out. Uh, but this goes back to what we spoke about last week, that, that the, more we, the more we step back from our time period and really take in a broad uh, you know, a, a broad view, uh, a, a wide lens view of, of history and the times we ourselves live in, what looks to us as just the way things happen to be in the world politically and, and uh, 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 you know, and, and naturally, we really see the miracle and we see the, and we see the wondrousness of it uh, as we step back from it. And we really see, uh, you know, that this is, uh, it's unquestionably the end of days. It, do you, do you think that in the yeshivas, because, I mean, Jerusalem, this is the, from 
with the yeshiva in Bet Shemesh, but Jerusalem, the old cities and the, the yeshivas, is this something that would be common knowledge, do you think? Um, I don't know if it's common knowledge. Uh, in, in, in the Torah study in the yeshivas, there's not a lot of emphasis placed on convincing ourselves that God's plan is coming true because we trust that it is coming true and, and, and therefore there's not a lot of focus on it. On, on, uh, um, so th uh, there are certainly people who are aware of this. I think, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of people studying in yeshivas, when they become aware of, 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 let's say, this calculation that I just shared with you, are just like very matter of fact about it. Like, oh, wow, that's very nice. You know, you know they kind of, because we know that, you know that God is running the show, um, and, uh, and, and as always in the yeshivas, there's a lot of emphasis on how are we living our lives, how are we improving the world, how are we engaging in what we call tikkun olam, the fixing of the world, um, what's our task, and, and are we fulfilling our task properly? Um, and sometimes that, that, that means uh, in terms of uh, legally, uh, in terms of Jewish law, are we fulfilling our task? Are we fulfilling our task properly in terms of, uh, in terms of what God wants from us um, in terms of the world? Uh, but focusing on these calculations, it's not a great focus. There are pl I mean, I, I can't speak for all yeshivas. Uh, I definitely did speak about it when you mentioned before that I, that I had a yeshiva where I taught, uh, I, had, I had many students over the years, and I, I definitely shared this with them. Um, uh, I don't, so I, I don't know if it's common knowledge, uh, but uh, I, I don't think it would surprise anyone. Now, the, the other... Uh, the the other issue is that the time of redemption, uh, you know, the, the heralding of the Messiah and the Elijah and you know the the great shofar blowing and all sorts of of, of things, uh, is that something connected with this with this time thing, or is that a bit different? It, it is connected with this uh, in in the sense that that those prophecies are coming true and will continue to come true, but we have to be very careful uh, to not uh, not insist on the most literal possible reading of these things, which almost turns the Word of God into a comic book or a caricature. When God writes, when it's written in Scripture that a great shofar will, will sound, that doesn't necessarily mean that there will actually be a ram's horn that will be blown that the world will hear. It could be, uh, you know, but it, it doesn't... It, Prophecy is often in a, in a language that is that it, that is uh, that is that has metaphor built into it. So it could be that the same role that the shofar plays, which is to wake us up and remind us of history and inspire us, you know, in in the Bible, sometimes the shofar is used to to rally the troops. We need to be rallied. So that shofar blast, that, that rallying of the troops and reminding us of God and reminding us of our place in history, the, all the roles that the shofar plays, the shofar is also associated with memory. In Leviticus 23, when it talks about uh, the day of remembrance where we blow the shofar, which is, which is the Jewish New Year, it's associated with reminding us. The shofar reminds us of the big picture. So when we talk about a great shofar blast at the end of days, we might insist that it actually be a real shofar that gets blown in Jerusalem, and God might say, no, that's not what I meant. Maybe, he, maybe it's a series of events that are broadcast on television worldwide. Um, so I, I think, uh, and this is very much a Jewish uh, uh, approach to these, to these prophecies. Yeah, because I think from a Christian evangelical point of view, they would tend to stick more that it would be a shofar, and so that's, you know, it's just the way that they tend to be more fixed in, in when they read something, they say, that's it, and it's settled, and, you know, yeah. we're not going to... Um... And, and, uh, and Christians will look at our interpretations, like the, interpreta the interpretation that I just said, and they'll say, well, you know, and it almost sounds blasphemous because it's not literal, but to, but to the Christian, I respond and say, it's not blasphemous, it's humble. It's humble. I don't know what God meant. I can't insist that he meant exactly what I think he meant. Let's see what he meant. Let's let it play out. 
you know. And uh, there's, there's an interesting, um, one of the pictures, and, uh, you know, the viewers will see this when they come to visit the land of Israel, is of the, of the soldier blowing the shofar at the, I mean, sorry, I think it's the rabbi, but he yeah, was Rabbi a soldier. Goran, Rabbi Goran. Pl blowing the shofar at the Western Wall and saying the, and the, the, the Western Wall is again in our hands. And, you know, I was thinking of the great shofar when I, when I thought about that, that, um, you know, it's only a small shofar and it's a soldier who was a rabbi, but he was blowing it and they, they, they were, again, you know, the Temple Mount and the Western Wall are in the hands of the, the Jewish people after thousands of years. Yeah, Absolutely uh, uh, an amazing thing. You know, we're out of time again. There's so much to, to talk about. I know that you've enjoyed it today. Uh, if you've got any questions or you would like to email us, don't forget you can email us at um, info at in the last days .com. You can visit the website www.inthelastdays.com and it's because of your support that we're able to do uh, this program and remember we're living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In the Last Days.